Hello and welcome to Zoo Life TV at the Toronto Zoo, where our mission is to connect people, animals and conservation science to fight extinction. My name is David and I'm a volunteer at the Toronto Zoo, an excited volunteer because the Toronto Zoo will be opening on Thursday, February the 10th to the public again. And we're just delighted about that. And I'm going to be there. Yay. <laughs> so if you are at the zoo on February the 10th, um, you know, if you see me around, just drop by, say hello. I'll be over by the Amur Tigers and, and uh, going through the Australasia Pavilion as well. Um, anyway, so today we're going to talk about teaching giraffes. You can see Kiko in there and he's wandering around going, okay, I think I'll grab myself something to munch. Um, it's the John. Hi, the John. Uh, Inventive Gibbon is here too. You missed the Toronto Zoo. Well, yeah, we all have. So it'll be nice to, to be back and, uh, and, and see all the animals again. You know, we, we get to see these animals on camera, which is wonderful. So thank you, Zoo Life TV, for that, because it is great to be able to see them when we can't, can't physically um, get to be there. Hi, Jules. But it is wonderful to be there in person, isn't it? There's nothing quite like seeing a giraffe in person. I've taken um, class visits through the giraffe building, and I always think it's kind of cool, you know, the, the class is gathered around me. They're all excited. They're making lots of noise. We round the corner and there are the giraffes right in front of us. And all the kids just go quiet because they are large, majestic, incredible animals. And I think with a lot of the kids, they just go, whoa, I knew what a giraffe was, but I didn't expect it to be like that because seeing an animal in person is so much more fantastic. Rhea Sunshine, good morning. And because Rhea Sunshine is here, we're going to have our Rhea Sunshine illuminating snake fact of the day. Not a question for you this time, just a snake fact. Snakes have teeth that are replaceable the same way sharks are. They just keep coming and coming and coming. I've got a model here of a diamondback rattlesnake skull. And you can see the, the fangs. Now, remember this model it has been done so that um, you can see the way the teeth come in. Normally those fangs, you're not gonna see three sets of fangs like that. You might in a living animal actually see two because the new ones, the sharper, ready to go ones always come in and push out the old ones. But you can see that um, they're, pretty, they're pretty impressive and these, fangs do fold down and um, lock into place when the mouth is is closed. So that's the way that works. But the teeth are replaceable like that. And you can see the teeth on the lower part of the jaw there as well, because they're not rooted really well. So the reason for that is they've got lots of these little sharp curved teeth to hold their prey in place, but um, they're not rooted so that they're like little grappling hooks. They hold on. And if the, the animal is actually alive when they bite in and a tooth gets ripped out, it's fine. They just grow a new one in place. So that's the um, diamondback rattlesnake skull and how the teeth are lined up. So I hope you enjoyed that. Anyway, back to teaching the, uh, the giraffes. So when you teach your dog how to sit, I hope, you know, you take, um, obedience lessons and you and you teach your dog the proper way to take commands and all that sort of thing. But there are, you know, a, a lot of people, a lot of people don't really understand how you train an animal. And when they get their dog, they go doggy, sit, and they push it into a sit position and tell it sit. And that's the, what, what they do every time. They push it into a sit position and say sit. And they hope that after enough repetitions, the dog understands that means sit. Well, you know, if you've got a, a smart dog, hopefully it catches on quickly. But if your dog is eh, maybe not the brightest light in the world, then it might not really get the message because you're doing all the work for it. When you're teaching an animal, just like when you're teaching a human, you want them to understand what's required of them. So you want them to figure it out for themselves. So when you teach an animal, 
there's a better way of doing it than just forcing it into position. And and let's face it, if you were trying to teach Kiko to lie down, what are you going to do? Kiko is like over 2,000 pounds. Uh, he's over a metric ton. And he is not going to let you push him down. I mean, you know, Keiko's 17 feet tall. How are you going to push him down? You're not. So teaching him to lie down isn't something that you can easily do just through force. So there are different ways of doing this. But the thing that um, the, the zoos do is they teach using positive reinforcement. And um, for those of you who've taken a little bit of psychology, it's operant conditioning. Now, operant conditioning, the, the theories of it um, were first um, espoused by B.F. Skinner. He's sort of the, the grandfather of uh, behavioral psychology. And um, in the 1940s, um, husband and wife team, um, the Breelands, came up. Good morning, Chelsea John. Uh, the Breelands came up with um, a way of training where with operant conditioning, what happens is the animal chooses what it wants to do and then it gets reinforced for it. But let's face it, that reinforcement isn't immediate because if you tell your dog, dog, sit, dog's not going to do it. But if the dog goes into a sit position and you reward it for that, the reward comes a few, maybe a couple of seconds after the dog's actually sat. So the dog might sit you go oh boy he sat and give him the reward and as you do that he goes oh food's coming and he and he jumps up to his on his back feet and so every time you've put out the reward what you've rewarded him for is jumping up on his back feet so what he thinks now is that you want him to jump up on his back feet when actually what you want him to do is sit so there had to be a better way and what the Breelands um did was they created what's called a bridge so that the animal understood as soon as I do this behavior, that's the right thing. And to do that, they used a clicker. Or in my case, I use this, this little clicker. It's a little bit different sound, but it's the same sort of principle. I, I just like this one because I can wear it on my finger when I'm training my dogs. So, um, <laughs> Zoo life. Heard a click. Where's the treat? Yeah, actually, Zoo life. My dog is sitting over there and he's just perked up like, okay, what did I do that I deserve a treat? Sorry, TJ. Uh, I'm faking you out. Anyway, so um, with this, it's the way you bridge that, that command. So if the if in this case, if my dog sits, I click right away and he knows that's the behavior. Because what I've done is I've associated that click with food. So what I did when I was starting to teach him was I just went, I had a whole bunch of kibble in my hand and I just went click, feed, click, feed, click, feed. So every time he heard the click, he knew that something was coming. Chelsea John says, I just jumped up. Yeah. So every time he got used to that, when he hears the click sound, he knows food is coming. And then once he realizes click means food, then I can attach the click to any behavior that he does. And, and then he realizes, oh, that's what you wanted. So for instance, when I was teaching TJ to walk backwards, the first time he took he put one foot backwards. That's all. Just one foot backwards. I clicked right away. And he went, oh, that's what you wanted. So um, Jules asks, is that joining classical conditioning to operant conditioning? Yes, that's basically it. So it, it really is. That's the combination. Very good, Jules. You know your, your psychology. So um, that's what's happening here. And the animal understands, oh, when you do that, movement. In TJ's case, it was he put one foot backwards. I clicked. He went, oh, that's what you wanted. He did it again. I clicked. Oh, and so he started moving backward just a little bit to see. And every time he moved backward, he got the click. And then the reinforcement came um, later. John asks, do you need different sound for each action? No, because this is a bridging um, what we call a bridging sound, okay? So this just means you did it right. That behavior, whatever you did, was the right thing. 
later, once you understand what I'm asking of you, I attach a command to it. So at first, there was no verbal command for TJ to walk backwards. Okay, it was just, he did it, I clicked. He did it, I clicked. Sometimes, I got to tell you, it takes patience because sometimes you got to wait a while for the animal to do what you want. If you're standing around with a giraffe, they like to stand there and they like to munch and they like to, you know, ruminate their food and all that kind of stuff. It could be a while before you get the behavior you want. So you got to be patient. But as soon as you get the behavior, you click and then they go, oh, that's what you wanted. And they're not stupid. They're catching on. They're trying to learn stuff. So they are really working on trying to figure out what you want. And then once you get the behavior repeated a couple of times, then you start to attach the command to it to get what you want. Um, it, it takes a little bit of time, but it works out beautifully. And you don't have to use a clicker. Like when we're doing dog training, we're doing dog training classes. A lot of people just use their voice. So um, you can do that at home. You know, you take a, a bunch of kibble and you just go, yes, 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 feed. Yes, feed. Yes, feed. So you're, you're, every time you say the word yes, the dog knows that's what I want. Now, the reason I personally would prefer a clicker to using the word yes, although the word yes is great because, or any other word, is great because the human voice is a tool that you always have on you, right? I don't always carry the clicker with me, which is on, you know, like I've got to be in training mode to be carrying a clicker on me. But when you use your voice, you can train at any time, anywhere, right? But the problem is, bye Ray Sunshine. Um, the problem is that if you use your voice and you use it differently, it's not a consistent tool. The clicker always sounds the same when you hit it. I can hit this clicker lightly or hard. It still sounds the same. Sorry, TJ. Um, but if I use my voice, I might say yes. Or if TJ does something great, I would go yes. Well, you know what? TJ is not stupid and he understands that yes is better than yes. So then it becomes a degree of inconsistency because he's waiting for the good yes, not the crappy yes, because he knows the good yes might be followed by like 15 treats or something like that. So that's why a lot of times you'll see at the zoo, they use clickers or they use whistles. That's the other thing, you know, with the polar bears, I know they, they were using whistles for a while. I don't know if they still do that, but it's handy, right? Um, and it also means, especially with a whistle, you can have both hands free and just have the whistle in your mouth and tweet whenever you need to do something, especially if you've got both hands occupied. And to tell you the truth, that's a little trick I picked up from the zookeepers myself, because I was talking to one of the polar bear keepers and, she said, that's why we use whistles so we can have our hands free. And I thought to myself, hmm, because I use hand signals with my dogs. And so if I have a clicker in one hand, it's distracting visually for them because the clicker's there and they're watching the clicker too. They're not silly, you know, they, they understand that's the thing that makes the good noise. So um, that's why for me, uh, using a whistle also became handy because I could have both hands free. I could give them different signals with different hands. And then they knew what the reinforcement, reinforcing sound was. It was the whistle. So that's the way uh, clicker training and uh, it's called bridge training also works. Um, it was, like I said, invented back in the 40s. And it really didn't catch on, I'd say, until late 1980s, the 1990s, because that's when people started to use it a lot for dogs. And then in the late 90s, I read that they started to use it a lot for horse training too. And once you get horse people and dog people using this type of training, it spreads like wildfire. And that's when it really caught on. Although zoos had used it a lot before that. And certainly, you know, that um, it places that had marine mammals, um, they would use clicker training as well. Because again, you can't force a dolphin to do what you want. You can't go dolphin jump through the hoop because how are you going to make it jump through a hoop, right? You've got to have 
a way of letting it know that that's what you want. So anyway, that's what we do with the drafts. And I'm just going to show you a little video. And let me just make sure I've got the right one. And this is going to be um, Amani being trained. Sorry, let me just start it over. And Amani is being trained here to open her mouth. Okay, so the signal to open your mouth for a giraffe is that. That's what the keepers are using. And you'll see in this video, um, Amani gets it right, I think once or twice, but she also messes it up because she's been target trained. Um, if you look at this picture, uh, I hope that's not too glary, you can see that there's that red target on the end of a stick. So Amani has been target trained to touch that with her nose. And that's a great way to move the giraffes around. Again, how are you going to move? You know, even Amani, she's like 11 feet tall. How are you going to move her easily? You can't just get in there and push her. She's almost like, I think, 900 pounds now or something. So you're not going to be able to get there and just push her. Plus, you're going to freak her out if you try and do that. So what they do is they teach them to go to and touch the, the target with their nose, and then they can move them around. And, you know, at first, like I said, you got to get them used to it, and giraffes can be a little spooky. So you, you just present the target, and the giraffe kind of goes, what the heck is that? Maybe it'll stay away, or maybe Amani, in Amani's case, she tends to be a brave little giraffe. She likes to investigate stuff. So she might have just come forward to sort of look at it, and then she got clicked for it. She got rewarded for coming towards it. So she went, oh, that's a good thing to go towards the red ball on the end of the stick. And so she came a little closer, and she got reinforced for that again. And and the, so progressively, the closer she got, the more she got reinforced, and she realized, oh, you want me to go and touch that silly red ball on the end of a stick with my nose? And she did it, and then she got jackpotted. She got a major um, treat for that. And so she realized, ah, oh, that's what you want. Okay. Um, Zuleif says, for anyone really enjoying this topic, one highly recommended book on this topic in the zookeeper world is Don't Shoot the Dog, The New Art of Teaching and Training. Yes, that's a very good book. I've got that one myself. So um, anyway, I'm going to show you this uh, this video, and this will show you uh, a little, a very short clip of Amani um, being trained. There's the command. You see, Amani's kind of fooling around. She's licking it with her tongue, but she's not really opening her mouth. So she's not getting reinforced. So there you go. She did it once, so she got, you heard the click. So she got the click, so that was good. But she was playing around with it, so she really didn't get reinforced because she's just licking it. She's not, um, She's not touching it. Now, there's the open mouth. She gets a treat after the click. Now, see, see she's playing around now. Hang on, sorry. Now, this is the... There, there was an open mouth. She got the click. Open mouth again, got the click. So there you can see, she when she does open her mouth the way she's required to, she gets the click, and there we go. And you think, well, that's a neat trick, but why do you want them to open their mouth? Because for health checks, there's a lot of things that the animals do that makes it easy. So if Amani learns to open her mouth and hold her mouth open, the vet can come along, look at all her teeth, look inside her mouth, make sure that she doesn't have any growths or anything, that she doesn't have any tooth problems and all that just from a cursory look. And when she is having difficulty, they can look in there without having to bother her because let's say she did have something like maybe she cracked a tooth or something like that. 
they can look in there at first and see if visually they can figure out what the problem is before they have to go in there in more detail and really get to the root the root of the matter yeah that's a, that was an unintentional pun folks okay chelsea john says amani is one smart giraffe yes she is but you know what all the zoo animals are pretty good about this because um not only are they smart they've got one great set of teachers if you've ever been lucky enough to see one of these training sessions um done by the keepers with the animals and and sometimes like if you go onto facebook um the zoo's facebook uh page you will see training sessions like this it's amazing it's fantastic what these keepers do and if you're lucky enough to have a chat with keeper you know if you see keepers going by and they don't look like they're overly busy you can have a chat with them they do have lots of work to do they work very hard and very long hours and they do a lot but sometimes they'll be standing around watching and they're quite willing to talk to the public and inform the public about what's going on and how they help the animals and what they do and you know just seeing it how a training session works or if you um if you book one of the wild encounters that the zoo provides at a fee and they'll show you a behind the scenes training session with say the polar bears or even the giraffes you know that's always possible it's really cool to see how the animals interact and how they're taught so it makes life so much better for the animals they can um, the keepers can then do routine movements and routine medical checks with the animals I mean, when if you have to draw blood from a polar bear or, a, or an amur tiger, anyone want to go in there with Vasily and draw blood? I think not. But um, Vasily had recently just had a successful blood draw because they taught him through this method of positive reinforcement that he can give blood and he gets really well rewarded for it. He gets stuff that he likes to eat. And, and that makes it all fun, right? It makes it really good. And different animals respond to different rewards. Like some animals, they love their food, so they'll do anything for food. The, um, the, the polar bears will do anything for liquid fat. It's great. Um, some animals, like with dogs that I, I've had training classes with, some dogs, they love their food, like TJ does. But other dogs, and they, they couldn't care less about getting a food treat. But if you have a ball in your hand and you play ball for them with them a couple of times, that's their treat. They'll do anything. They'll work on any sort of behavior you want as long as they get to play ball afterward. Uh, Jules asks, does clicker training work even if the zookeeper doing the training changes? Does it depend on the animal? Um, yes, to a certain degree. The animal does have more familiarity and comfort with certain trainers so it's going to be a better experience for them it's like if you consider yourself during your life when you went to school you had certain teachers who really made an impact because you enjoyed the way they taught and you liked their methods so you learned really well from them and that's something that the animals do too there are certain people that they really enjoy working with and they learn better from them but having said that same thing with you, you've gone through school and it didn't matter whether your math teacher was your favorite teacher or just an okay teacher, you still learn math, right? So same thing with the animals, they can learn from anyone. And even if they like you, if you're a good teacher, uh, even if they like you and someone else is a better teacher, that person can still teach them well, okay? That's why when you take your dog to training class, you're not experienced and you might not be the best teacher in the world because you're doing some things wrong because you just don't understand the process yet. And that's why the trainer can take your dog and in five minutes have your dog sitting up and rolling over where you couldn't even get your dog to do a basic sit because the trainer knows how to reinforce and when to reinforce because timing is everything. The type of reinforcement is really important. All that kind of stuff really works. So that's kind of, you know, to answer your question, there's a yes and no. There's, yeah, if you have a really good relationship with a really good keeper, 
then the animal is going to learn super well and super fast and it helps if the animal's smart too but you can still have a keeper who understands what they're doing and might not have a relationship with the animal because keepers can change with um, when they shift areas so sometimes you know a keeper might be working in the african savanna area for two or three years build up a relationship with the animal but then transfer over to Indo-Malaya, the Eurasia area, something like that, and start working with another animal. And so the animal builds up a, a different relationship with a new person. So it's it happens all the time. And it, it actually is probably good for the animals too, because it keeps them mentally tuned, as well as keeping the keepers mentally tuned. It's nice to have a bond with an animal, but one of the things that the the Toronto Zoo and other accredited zoos like to do is they like to keep their animals not only physically fit and engaged, they like to especially like to keep their animals mentally fit and engaged because that's important. You know, a lot of people have to um, realize it's not just you want the animal to be physically healthy, you want it to be mentally healthy. That's super important. Anyway, so that's my talk for today. Um, remember that later today on Zoo Life, uh, you'll have a chance to see the, the California condor talk. The California condors are one of the new things, uh, cameras that Zoo Life has brought up. Really exciting. They're cool birds. Really cool. And then um, I think later in the day, there's also going to be um, meerkats. Um, <laughs> Zoo Life is showing condors on the chat yeah and then um tomorrow morning uh the toronto zoo will be back with a gorilla chat in the morning and then i'm going to be doing an amur tiger talk yay i only get to do amur tiger talks maybe once every three weeks or so so i really do enjoy them uh vasily mazzy mila all are wonderful cats just they, they all got their own neat personalities they're, they're super animals um i i think those of you who've tuned in and, and watched zoo life um see mila growing up right before your eyes it is so cool isn't it it's great so thank you uh to the toronto zoo and zoo life for doing all this uh <laughs> tiger eyes wow tigers and uh, david combination yeah well yeah it's gonna be interesting isn't it okay um oh by the way is giraffe a pixie cat out there because if you are um I'm going to put in, you are, okay, Giraffe and Pixie Cat, I just wanted to say thank you for your question last week about the leg articulation. So here's an answer for you. Um, I, I sent um, the question off to a zookeeper and they came back and um, I also gave you a link to an article on how giraffes uh, stand on their spindly legs and that talks about the you were asking about the the leg lock articulation so that talks about that as well uh, chelsea john just so you know i did send the question about the difference between is there a difference between male and female giraffes at birth in terms of size and weight and i haven't received any um response back yet which is actually odd because usually the keepers are really fast at getting back to me whenever so i'll i'll ask uh karen our supervisor again but it just might be you know like let's face it mastaris do potentially any day now so i'm sure the keepers are really busy so having a question for me might not be high on their priority list so i hope you understand that and, and um, just please be patient and, and sorry it's taking a little bit of a while a little bit of while okay um okay giraffe a pixie cat uh Glad that you, you're happy with the answer. And um, did the keepers give you an answer on the tiers of drafts, AMS asks? And AMS, um, I haven't heard back on that because when I asked about Chelsea John's birth thing, I also asked about the tiers question, not, not specifically about the black tiers that you asked about, but just about tears in general, because without tear ducts, since giraffes don't have tear ducts, I was curious too, like, what happens if they get something in their eye? Because their eyelashes uh, protect them. Of course, they've got those beautiful long eyelashes that keep 
bugs and that sort of out and, and cut down on things flying into their eye. But surely they've got to get specks of dust or plant material or something in their eye every once in a while. And how does that work to, to flush out their eyes since they don't have tear ducts? So I haven't heard back yet. And uh, when I do, I'll, um, I'll either put it in the chat or put it in the Q&A section, um, whatever. Anyway, oh, I'm running, I'm running out of time. So thank you very much for joining me. And I hope to see you tomorrow afternoon at the Tiger Talk. Thanks a lot. Bye for now.